Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India towards neural dependency parsing. For uh, neural networks, we uh, did feed forward net network, which had uh, total sum square error. Uh, we need a uh, softmax layer at the outermost uh, uh, configuration for the neural network. So softmax, of course, is a variation of uh, the error function, and uh, that is what will be used in these applications and the the softmax requires the error function to be uh, cross entropy cross entropy measure okay let's proceed but the is parsing and uh, yesterday we uh, were looking at uh, different parsing algorithms uh, for dependency and uh, uh, there were uh, rule-based approaches and data-driven approaches. Just to remind ourselves, uh, dependency parsing is <clears throat> of the following form. Um, we have a linear sequence of words. Uh, the athlete runs fast who also jumps high. So here who refers to the athlete? And uh, here the dependencies are uh, shown root uh, goes to runs which is the main verb who runs uh, athlete so that is why n sub nominal subject why nominal subject i don't know if you have uh, if you have considered that point so jotsna uh, slide has to be entered here n why n sub n for nominal uh, because languages uh, do have uh, non nominal subjects so, for example, a dative subject is very common in Indian languages. Mujhe am chahiye. So, in English, you will say I want mango, where I is nominative case. Mujhe uh, is a dative case, sampradhan karak. Okay, I am the beneficiary, but still it is the subject of the sentence. And uh, therefore, it should be d subj, that is dative subject. So this is a peculiarity of Indian languages. Check with your own mother tongue. You will see that uh, it is not uh, common for us to say, "Main am chahta hu." Nay, "Mujhe am chahiye." In Bengal, it will become "Amar am chai." So, is the suffix. So, like English, we have subjects which uh, are non-nominative. So that's why n sub. Uh, when it uh, comes to Indian languages, we will have d sub for dative, or um, g sub for genitive subject, and so on. So athlete is uh, running. So athlete determiner the athlete. Uh, the athlete refers to a definite athlete. So when we go to deeper levels of semantics, then the will disappear and it will uh, give rise to a feature for the word athlete. So un, runs is the main verb and fast. Fast is adverb modifier. How does it run? Runs fast. Then uh, we see a, a transition to the verb of the clausal component of the sentence. Who also jumps high. So the, this is actually composed of two simple sentences. The athlete runs fast. He also jumps high. So instead of he, we have who, which is a relative pronoun referring to the athlete. Now notice this arc uh, C comp, that is conjunctive uh, complementizer, which links runs with jumps. So the clausal verb is typically linked with the main verb with uh, this kind of relationship. So the dependency is from main verb to the uh, subordinate verb subordinate clause verb and uh, subject is uh, who which has WP as the level WP means uh, a WH pronoun okay who what which they are called WH words and there here it is like a pronoun 
also is a adverbial modifier for jumps and high is another adverbial modifier for jumps. So you must be very clear about uh, the dependency relations in a sentence, the dependency graph which comes from the sentence. The sentence is a linear sequence of words. So this is a different kind of parsing. In uh, constituency parsing, we extract the constituents. The phrases are marked and they are organized in the form of a tree. In dependency parsing, we again get a tree, but here the arcs are labeled with relationships and the um, nodes in the tree are the words, except the first node, which is root, that is not part of the sentence. So this is a dependency tree, and this sentence can have another re, um, uh, variation. The athlete who also jumps high runs fast. So in this case, the main sentence is the athlete runs fast, like uh, previous sentence. But who also jumps high is brought closer to athlete because who also jumps high is a qualifier for athlete. And it is a good rule of thumb, good practice. If you can keep the qualifier um, and the object qualified close to each other, or if you keep the uh, head and the modifier close to each other. So the result of that is that uh, runs is far from athlete because there is an intervening text who also jumps high. And runs fast is as before. Um, so I believe there should have been a N subject relation with the athlete. Anyway, so we'll see that. So runs to jumps, there is this uh, C comp uh, arc. And uh, jumps to who as before, jumps to also as before, jumps to high as before. OK, so this is the other uh, dependency tree coming from the sentence. So dependency graph, dependency tree, these are important for structural information in the sentence. Now let's go to uh, the algorithms once again. The first algorithm was rule based, OK, where uh, we promote the heads uh, from uh, below to the higher level non terminals and thereby obtain the dependency tree. So this is best illustrated by one example. Which uh, I have constructed for you. Take the English sentence Ram stayed at home in the evening. The Hindi sentence is Ram Sham ko ghar mein raha. Let me just correct this a bit. Ram Sham ko ghar par raha. Okay. So Ram stayed at home in the evening. Ram Sham ko ghar par raha. So let's examine their trees. So S goes to NPVP in English. NP goes to NNP, proper noun, goes to Ram. VP goes to VBD, past tense verb, which goes to state. VP also goes to PP. PP goes to P preposition and that goes to at. PP goes to NP. P and NP. NP goes to N. N goes to home. State at home. And then uh, PP again goes to P. P goes to in. NP goes to DT and DT goes to the N goes to evening. So the structure is word phrase goes to VBD PP PP. So you can have any number of uh, preposition phrases which are at the same level, indicating they are directly linked to the main verb of the sentence. So if uh, home was qualified by another preposition phrase, then PP would have come below home. OK, PP would have come below home. Try to construct a sentence. Uh, stayed at home in the city, for example. OK stayed at home by the side of the river. So uh, there the PP can come below home and then it will be a deeper parse tree. How does the Hindi parse tree look? Uh, S goes to NP, NNP 
which is RAM. S goes to VP, which is also fine. Now begins to uh, now uh, the difference of the language character begins to surface. Here VP is PP PP VVD. In English it was VVD PP PP. And this is because English is called the head initial language. OK. Uh, the head, uh, I think yesterday there was a bit of uh, confusion, but English is definitely linguist in linguistics called head initial language. So that means uh, the word that defines the type of the phrase is in the beginning of the phrase. OK, so for example, PP preposition phrase at home at is in the beginning of the preposition phrase in the evening preposition phrase in is the preposition it is in the beginning of the phrase stayed at home in the evening that is the verb phrase so the verb is in the beginning of the verb phrase okay so this is the property of the head initial language where the head is in the beginning of the phrase and what is the head head is that word which gives the phrase its characteristic okay so in a verb phrase v is the head verb is the head in a preposition phrase p or the preposition is the head um, okay so that is the uh, that is the notion hindi on the other hand is head final language so that's why in the verb phrase p p p p v v d the verb goes to the end sham ko ghar par raha sham ko ghar par raha so the verb raha goes to the end state was in the beginning of the verb for english let's see pp pp for english is preposition phrase in hindi pp is post position phrase because the equivalent of preposition becomes post position it goes to the end of the post position phrase so in pp we find npp in english pp was pnp in hindi it is npp there has been an inversion so sham ko not ko sham but uh, um, in the evening in english in before the evening later here in or preposition ko is later noun in the beginning sham ko ghar par at home at in the beginning home uh, later hindi ghar par ghar in the beginning par later so you see this is the notion of head final and head initial languages so clearly uh, you can easily convert a dependency algorithm from developed for english to a dependency algorithm for hindi just by by making this inversion adjustment so this is the comparison of the constituency parse tree for english and uh, can somebody verify that you are looking at two parse trees one for english one for hindi on the screen yes, sir. Hmm? okay and uh, you can see that head final and head initial languages require inversion okay so uh, now we proceed to constructing the uh, dependency tree so the first english english has s n p v p n n p v v d p p p p and then stayed at home in the evening so now we begin to uh, uh, begin to uh, home onto the head and then keep percolating the head up into the non terminal level so let's take ram ram is n n p proper noun and goes to NP. So this is uh, this is this is where Ram ascends to and stays. Now we come to the verb phrase in the verb phrase. I see uh, state is the main verb. So it goes up, up, goes, go, keeps on going up and sits at the uh, topmost non terminal in this subtree which is the verb phrase. So it stays at state. So it stayed. The state is staying at VP. We come to the preposition phrase at home. Here for preposition phrase PP 
uh, P is the head. Preposition is the head. So at is percolated up and it sits at PP. Similarly, home gets percolated up through N and sits at NP, home. In uh, the evening, this is a preposition phrase. So in begins to travel up and sits at PP. The evening, evening uh, is the head here. Go, moves up and goes to uh, the NP and sits at NP. Now here uh, you might object that uh, you said English is head initial, but we find that in this NP noun phrase, uh, uh, the noun is at the end of the phrase. It is not in the beginning of the phrase. So this is where a bit of uh, adjustment comes. I said yesterday, this head finalness and head initialness is predominantly majority beha behavior. But for adjectival phrases, now noun phrases containing adjectives, the adjectives go before the noun in English. OK, in French, in fact, French is a purely head initial uh, language in French even. The adjective goes after the noun. OK, uh, blue palace. Blue palace, blue is adjective, palace is noun. So noun goes after the adjective. In uh, French, it will be meso blue. Meso blue. So blue is coming after meso, which is uh, palace. So that's a proper head initial behavior. And here we find that uh, the head initialness is uh, departed from the regular in case of adjective noun combination. But anyway, uh, this percolation up as has happened and the topmost uh, 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 non terminal defining the subtree. That is where the word moves keep going up. The head go, goes up there and stays there. Modifier stay below. So once we have done this uh, movement upward, uh, then we are in a position to construct the dependency tree. So you see, this is the uh, uh, this is the constituency parse tree: S, N, P, V, P, N, N, P, V, B, D, P, 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 uh, N, P, N, P goes to N, P, N, P, N, P goes to D, T, N, D, T goes to the N goes to evening, and all the words head words have percolated up to their correct positions. So now I just keep stripping the non-terminals and the corresponding arcs from the constituency tree and obtain my dependency tree, which is unlabeled. So state is obtained from S, and then RAM is obtained from NNP from NP. So state and RAM are connected. Then state and at are connected because at has come to the top of the uh, subtree rooted at PP. So at is linked with state. And then at is linked with home because home is the modifier for the head at in the preposition phrase PP at home. Similarly, evening is uh, uh, similarly in is linked with state. OK. Because in is the head of the preposition phrase in the evening. So in gets directly linked to state, the main verb of the sentence. Evening comes below, uh, uh, evening comes below in, and the comes below evening. Because uh, uh, in NP, the word that is eligible for promotion is evening, not the. Because the is not the defining part of speech for the noun phrase. For the noun phrase, the defining part of speech is the noun evening. So this is a very simple, elegant algorithm which will produce the unlabeled dependency tree for you. OK, and this tree state drum at home in evening the. This particular tree is uh, is depicted in a different form. Uh, but equivalent form here in the uh, in the diagram below. Uh, are you looking at the dependency tree on the screen, please? Can somebody? Yes, verify? sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. OK, so you see I'm simply 
uh, writing or drawing the tree in a different manner. From state, there is a uh, is an arc going to Ram, another going to at, another going to in. So as is the case in this simple tree, state to Ram to at to in. So state to Ram to at to in. Then at <clears throat> goes to home. So at goes to home. In goes to evening, correct? And evening goes to the. So now, uh, uh, now comes uh, the question. So this this is identical to the rooted tree, which is rooted at state. And in this particular dependency tree, we are following the convention. The root goes to state. Now uh, look at the uh, labels. Sum is n subj, nominative subject. And uh, uh, state to at is called the case relation. Okay, case. It's called case. So C A S E. And state to in is also case. Now at to whom is what is called the P O V J preposition object. Any preposition needs a noun phrase after, uh, to come after it. That is the requirement or the akanksha. It's called akanksha in our Indian linguistic tradition, Sanskrit. So at has an akanksha of a noun. So that is home. And the, and the relationship is POBJ. Similarly, in has akanksha for a noun, that is evening. POBJ, preposition object comes. And DET is the determiner which links evening with the DET is determiner. So this is how we um, obtain the dependency tree, though we did not discuss how we get this uh, uh, dependency relations. But Getting that unlabeled tree itself is more than half the battle or let's let's call it half the battle. OK, after that, when you have to produce the uh, produce the uh, dependency relations, you will be guided by the properties of the words. So stay requires an uh, uh, requires an object. And that object is supplied through a preposition phrase. So since there is a preposition, linking with state, I can <clears throat> give a rule to produce the case level there. Similarly, state and at, I require the case level to be produced there. So uh, how do I know at is a preposition? I presume that the lower level of NLP has worked, OK? And that has produced the part of speech of at, at as a preposition for whom it is now. So th this job has been done by part of speech dagger. After that, Chankar and uh, constituency parser gave me this particular tree. OK, S goes to NPVP and so on. And from there, uh, I have been able to take advantage of all this lower level work done and obtain an unlabeled dependency tree. And then I produce the labels through some kind of classification algorithm, which picks the correct relation level from a list of relation levels. So you know an overall idea about how dependency parsing can be achieved uh, this is shown here now and uh, so this is one approach to dependency tree construction let us carry this forward to hindi also uh, okay an interesting point is missed uh, so see from uh, that dependency tree root and sub case etc i can get a very compact dependency tree by dropping what is called function words. Function words are prepositions, conjunctions, determiner. I leave only the uh, content words, namely adjective, adverb, noun, and verb. I retain only those four categories. Then I have a very compact graph. Root goes to state. This n sub goes to ram. And then state to evening is the time relationship. So notice that in and the both have disappeared. And state to whom is location information, loc. So this uh, becomes an extremely simple dependency graph, but with uh, very informative uh, levels, very, very informative levels. I don't have case and prep, uh, case and preposition object. So case and preposition object have given rise to, case and preposition object have given rise to a deeper level, location and time. Okay. So uh, this requires 
more uh, uh, intelligence on the part of the uh, classifier and this is a much deeper meaning wise much deeper representation than the unlabeled uh, dependency tree first of all and then level dependency tree where the uh, relations are more shallow so uh, n sub also becomes uh, deeper you know when the classifier is more intelligent so that will give rise to what is called the agent relationship ram state uh, home evening so agent is the agency the per person who performs the activity so uh, n sub is shallower than agent so jyotsna please write this point n sub would give rise to agent when it becomes a uh, deeper representation towards meaning so this graph which is more compact has less number of arcs such a graph is an example of what is called semantic role level graph uh, jyotsna please add this semantic role level graph because here the relations are capturing the exact semantics of the situation so the person doing the staying is ram agent and where is he staying at home location information when is he staying at home uh, evening time information so you see these are much more informative relationships that's why they are called semantic roles and semantic role labeling is a very fundamental activity in natural language processing when we do semantic role labeling we are much closer to uh, the meaning of the sentence than other representations however these other representations which are more shallow they cannot be neglected because they are the stepping stones to deeper representation okay they cannot be uh, bypassed normally normally they cannot be bypassed uh, in our journey to the deeper meaning of the sentence of course now there are these neural data driven approaches where we use the term end to end so when you're doing end to end it is assumed that these lower level nlp activities are taken care of in the layers of the neural network but that is of course a matter of speculation and uh, that is the explainability research which is uh, quite intense these days so notice the compact representation state agents agent is ram location home and time evening period we are done with the essential information and now you can possibly understand the meaning of the label case case means relationship of the uh, uh, nouns with the verbs this is called case in indian linguistics it is called karak okay karta karak karm karak sampradan karak and so on so this location time agent they are called karak relationships they indicate the semantic relationship of the nouns with the main verb of the sentence so now we move to hindi dependency parsing so as usual we'll take the constituency parts of the hindi hindi uh, sen sentence and we will recall that hindi is head final so in any verb the defining word for that verb goes to the end of the phrase so ram sham ko ko later ghar par par later raha raha at the end of the sentence at the end of the verb phrase so again we begin doing percolation up for the defining words or the head words so raha keeps moving up through vbd to vp because raha is the word which makes the verb phrase the verb phrase ghar par par move keeps moving up and goes and sits at pp node ghar moves up and sits at np node ghar sham ko ko uh, moves up and sits at pp sham moves up goes and sits at np ram goes through nnp and sits at np ram so then uh, we eliminate all the inessential no not arcs and also the non terminals and we get the structure raha goes to ram ko and par ko goes to sham and par goes to ghar so this is uh, very similar to the uh, english dependency tree state ram at in 
at home in evening evening the since uh, hindi is uh, hindi doesn't demand an article uh, before the noun this is also a peculiarity or characteristic of languages there are languages which which for which uh, article is compulsory before a noun in english for example a singular noun cannot stand alone it needs either a an or the except for plurals okay boys play on the ground a boy plays in the ground the boy plays in the ground okay you cannot live a singular without an article and french is all the more strict with articles even for plurals they demand an article okay so here hindi doesn't demand an article so the is dropped so you have ram ko par sham ghar and raha is the root so from there you come to the uh, labeled uh, dependency tree as is the convention so root is raha n sub ram case to ko ko to sham through preposition object raha to case par par to preposition object uh, ghar so this is same as the english tree and when we do this compacting and go to deeper semantic level we go to a representation here root goes to raha the main verb raha goes to ram n subject it will become agent for deeper semantics and raha to sham time raha to ghar location to the english tree except for words so do you see that you see that the english and hindi tree are identical uh, as far as labels and the arcs are concerned arc and arc labels are concerned only the words are different ram ram raha stayed sham evening ghar home that's all so uh, so this uh, this say uh, this uh, tells us many important things so just now this point should be on the slide so what we understand is that when we go to deeper levels of analysis in natural language processing the language differences begin to melt away language differences begin to melt away they become less and less prominent on the other hand languages begin to uh, seem to uh, be coming closer and closer to each other so notice the dependency tree there is hardly any difference between english dependency tree and hindi dependency tree uh, only the words are different okay but you take a shallower representation which is the constituency tree the constituency tree um, shows that there are a lot of differences between the english constituency parse tree and the hindi constituency parse tree mainly because the um, headedness is different yeah, english is head final uh, head initial hindi is head final that's why the verb comes in the beginning of the verb phrase preposition comes in the beginning of the preposition phrase in hindi the post position goes to the end of the pp the verb goes to the end of the vp so that difference is uh, apparent in between english and hindi but constituency parse tree in some sense is little shallower than dependency tree dependency tree is closer to underlying meaning then the constituency tree constituency tree is essentially grouping the phrases and sub phrases okay that is the main thing but it doesn't show what is the head and what is the modifier and if you do not know what is the head and the modifier you do not know the relations which exist which prevail in the sentence and if you do not know what the relations in the sentence are you do not know the semantic roles the semantic roles the meaning roles that are played by the words in the sentence you will recall long time back we remarked that a sentence is a stage and the verbs nouns adjectives adverbs are players they are the actors on that stage the main actor is the verb and other actors link to that main actor and that linkage is called semantic role okay they are playing their roles and those roles are semantic role evening what is this uh, role played by evening evening is playing a role in that in in that acting evening is playing a role that role is it is playing uh, it is providing the information of time 
home is uh, playing the role of place and providing that information of space. OK, so these information are universal. Given the two sentences, take any language their dependency graphs are likely to be very, very similar. OK, so the so the difference between languages begin to reduce as we go to deeper levels of analysis in NLP. So that has a very nice implication in a lot of large downstream NLP applications. In particular, uh, in machine translation, which we will uh, discuss uh, very soon after we cover RNN by LSTM sequence to sequence uh, converters, transformer machines, but time is very limited. Next uh, semester, we'll spend a lot of time on uh, these uh, deep neural network techniques, those architectures, and how they interact with the language properties. That's a very interesting discussion. So uh, when the language differences are smaller, then the translation effort is also smaller. So this uh, triangle is called Vokua triangle, very famous in NLP and in machine translation. Uh, can you please verify you are looking at Vokua triangle on the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, so you see the source language text. We begin to do NLP on the text. So first words are isolated, then syntactic structure or the parse tree obtained. Then semantic structure, that is semantic roles are obtained. And then we come to a very idealistic representation called interlingua, where all differences between languages melt away. They disappear. OK, and this is called the interlingua representation. And our um, um, our work on NLP in IIT Bombay, Seafield, actually began with an interlingua project, which we had got in those days, 1996 from United Nations. And the goal of that project in, was to, uh, to uh, break all the language barrier. Very, very ambitious goal by United Nations to facilitate understanding amongst nations by breaking the language barrier. That was the goal. It was called Universal Networking Language Project. 15 countries were participating in this, and we from IIT Bombay was uh, in India representative there. And our uh, journey in NLP began with interlingua. Therefore, you know, we have been always uh, married to the question of meaning of the uh, sentence. So the interlingua is the deep, deepest representation sentence, captures all essential meaning components and removes the ambiguity completely. But look at uh, the journey from the source language text to interlingua. Interlingua is language independent. Text Source language text is language dependent. It is for a particular sentence. And that goes through NLP of extraction of words, part of speech tags, syntactic tree, semantic roles, and then finally the interlingua meaning graph. And when we begin to generate the target language sentence, that is how machine translation demands us to operate. We go from interlingua to uh, interlingua to semantic structure to syntactic structure and finally finally to words and the words are placed with respect to each other to generate the target language sentence. So this is the most intuitive view of machine translation. But this idealistic situation, this ideal situation of course has been modified tremendously uh, because many times the two languages are very close to each other. So if I take Assamese and Bengali or Punjabi Hindi, okay, or uh, let's say Kannada Telugu or uh, uh, Catalan and Spanish, uh, German and Dutch, these are very close languages. So they are uh, going up to the complete interlingua level is something of an overkill, okay. I don't need so much of disambiguation in translating from, let's say, Assamese to Bengali. I don't need so much. I simply have to do some adjustments uh, for changing of the words here and there. OK, uh, for example, boy. Boy is chele in Bengali. 
and Laura in SMEs. So just change Chele to Laura, Larka, uh, and you get the SMEs equivalent. And structurally, the two languages are so similar to each other, you really don't have to construct the parse tree and then do parse tree transformation like we did for head initial to head final transformation for English to Hindi. You don't have to do all that. OK, you can simply begin to replace the words. And you will get almost a uh, an Assamese awesome sentence or almost a Bengali sentence. Same is the case for Spanish and Catalan, Dutch and German. OK, you, without much work, without much of NLP, just by transforming words, you will get uh, the target language sentence. So, so much of hard work doing deep analysis going up to interlingua and from interlingua to begin to generate the words of the target language sentence is not necessary when the two languages are close to each other. So on this we have done extensive research in CFILT. Dr. Anup Gupta who was my PhD student. His main work was this. How to do translation between closed languages. But still there are issues. You should not be misled to believe that translation between two closed languages is trivial. No, by, by no means. OK, there are uh, adjustments required which are non-trivial and which an which an uh, native SMA speaker or native Catalan speaker or native Dutch speaker will not accept as a perfect meaning will be conveyed, but the translation will not be perfect. So this uh, celebrated uh, triangle is called the Vaqua triangle. Vaqua was a French physicist, but his uh, work has given rise to the foundation for machine translation in natural language processing. So the deeper the NLP analysis, the closer the representations and easier the analysis. Now if you question answering, summarization, um, textual inference, OK, all those uh, sentiment analysis, all those uh, important downstream NLP tasks, uh, can they also benefit from deeper language analysis? Yes, they can. And uh, that is a matter of very interesting reflection. For example, uh, can summarization benefit from interlingua representation? Yes, it can. Because in the interlingua representation, the subtrees which are not really contributing to the meaning, essential meaning of the sentence, but are um, additional information, OK? Those subtrees can be eliminated and you can keep only the essential trees uh, throughout the document, which will give rise to the uh, succinct summary of uh, the text. Question answering, can it benefit? Of course it can, because interlingua represents the meaning unambiguously. So you can ans produce the answer also unambiguously. Sentiment analysis, can it benefit? Yes, because in sentiment analysis, there is something called aspect-based sentiment analysis. I express an express a sentiment about the movie, but which aspect of the movie? The songs, the dances, the choreography, uh, the photography, what? Which aspect? So that becomes um, apparent through dependency relation. And uh, here also the question of at which level of the NLP analysis will you operate? That uh, is an important question, OK? Maybe you don't need to go up to, to full interlingua representation. Maybe you only with dependency relation, which will show you which aspect is important for the meaning. So, uh, so, so the purpose of this discussion was to show you that uh, uh, deeper analysis is very important to cross the language barrier and also to facilitate uh, uh, complex natural language processing tasks. But all this work may not be necessary depending on the situation. So now uh, uh, you probably have understood the. The um, English and Hindi dependency parts, especially the compact de dependency parts and see how they are. Uh, identical to each other. Now uh, uh, we have to uh, understand head directionality, head final languages. These are head final structure. It's complements. Hindi is a strong head final language. This is true about all Indian languages except Khasi and one Kashmiri language where uh, the verb goes in the front of the sentence like Arabic. And head initial languages uh, have head initial structure. Head of a phrase precedes its complements. 
the example is English is a strong head initial language. And head is the component of the phrase which determines the category of the phrase. Uh, head of a verb phrase is the verb. OK, so this is head. Uh, head. Um, head directionality. And uh, rule based approach for constituency parsing to dependency parsing. There are two main things. Identify all the head dependent relations. Identify the correct dependency relations. And uh, task involver, <coughs> involver marking the head and make the head of each non head depend on the head. So. So this is the uh, work that we will examine for you. And uh, and it is not a difficult task as you might have seen so far. So CP to DP <coughs> is obtained by percolating the head words upward and DP to CP is also very possible. OK, if you have the compact uh, DP, then a lot of essential information is lost. Then you, al you almost do a natural language generation. But if you have all the uh, non essential uh, information also in, in particular if the whole sentence is there without eliminating any of the word, then DP to CP is also an easy task. OK, you apply the reverse process of percolation up. Now you do percolation down. So what is the process here? You can see that in evening the so in is the head of the phrase. So here you will put a PP in place of in and bring in uh, below PP through a preposition. And similarly, uh, evening will come uh, below that PP as NP and NP will go to N and will go to evening. So this is the first process of percolation down and that will give from give rise to the CP or constituency parse from the dependency parse. OK, so now uh, very quickly in the room in five minutes after which we'll take question answer. We uh, have seen yesterday that there is a transition based parsing. Uh, so this was exemplified by this sentence. Book me the morning flight. The stack contains the root. Now shift the word into the stack. You have root and book me the morning. Me the morning flight is in the input buffer list. Transfer me then the morning flight transfer then move book and me can be linked through a dependency relation. So right arc and that uh, takes out uh, me from the stack. Now root and book remains. Now shift the shift shift morning shift flight. Uh, um, shift the sorry. Then thou and book. Uh, finally I have root book the morning and then flight. And uh, after many such uh, shiftings, I have root book the morning flight. Everything is on the stack. Nothing in the input buffer. Morning and flight can now be linked through left arc. Uh, the and flight can be linked through left arc. Book and flight can be linked with right arc. And root and book is linked with right arc. And finally root also pops out. So the stack empty, input buffer empty, algorithm terminates. And these are the repository of relations. So this is called transition based par parsing, very elegant um, algorithm where the operations are three shift right arc and left arc. Now how do you decide which operation to do? So that is a uh, decision making process uh, operated by a set of rules or by a model which has been trained from data using machine learning. So that is an example of a machine learning classifier situation. And in recent times, the neural network has been used for making those decisions. So you can see here there is a softmax layer and there is a hidden layer. There is this input layer. The sentence here is he has good control. He has good, good control. Now this decision is made to shift or to do left arcing or to do right arcing. And you can do more. You can also do the classification level. Should it be n sub or d object or case or p object? All these you can do in the softmax layer. So uh, the paper for that I have uh, put on the may on the WhatsApp list. Uh, um, the place you can place it in Teams also and Moodle also. Please read that paper, and it sure. should be uh, it should be easy for you to understand that paper in light of the fact that transition parser is making decisions at every step. And these decisions are being taken by the neural network, which is was called Oracle. 
So now let me stop. And uh, uh, the summary is we understood head final, head initial. We understood how uh, constituency parser can give rise to dependency parser. We understood how at deeper levels of meaning representation, language differences get reduced. OK, so then it becomes multilingual work becomes easier after doing NLP on the source sentence. OK, questions? So the first question today is by Saurabh Garg. Mm. Uh, we should keep the head and modifier close, but mm. when we bring who also jumps high mm. close to the athlete, it mm. takes runs away from the athlete. How do we prioritize which head modifier pair to keep uh. close? Um, so I think your question is, what is better to keep runs close to athlete? Or who also jumps close to athlete? Is that the question? Sort of. Yes, sir. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is another point of view, but uh, it has been found that if you keep the head modifiers close to each other, adjacent to each other, then co many computational processes um, are uh, uh, are better. So, in in transition-based dependency parsing, for example when the when the modifier is immediately adjacent to the head then uh, the pushing popping operation is um, i believe less in number and also easier to decide compared to when the modifier is far away now athlete and run uh, going you know far away from each other is not so much of a problem because the if you uh, absorb the modifier with the head and create a phrase phrase then you will see that again athlete and run come close to each other so in that recursive uh, processing of the sentence uh, athlete and run again come to come close to each other once the modifier is absorbed but yes this this is not an easy answer to give yeah. Uh, again, Saurav asks, mm. using the head initial logic, we should promote uh, NOV in the phrase NOV to November in the phrase November 29. But did we promote 29? Why did we promote 29 in the last lecture? If the phrase yes. is 29 November, will we still promote 29? Okay, in the last lecture, I think uh, you know there are many things which are skipped. Uh, please follow today's lecture for this percolation up okay quite a few things have been uh, skipped in the in yesterday's discussion on uh, promotion of words that was only to introduce you to the parsing process what we discussed today is much more methodical and concrete right parth asks i might have missed it yes, what point was being conveyed in the athletes example hmm. What was being conveyed in the athlete example? Yes. Ah, OK, so uh, what was being conveyed is uh, no. It, what was being conveyed is the idea of dependency parsing. Dependency parsing. Uh, how does a dependency parse look? Essentially, that is what was being conveyed. Uh, sir. In this, uh, it was like uh, you were saying some projectivity is being. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, projectivity. So I'm saying that uh, the athlete who jumps high uh, is uh, maintaining projectivity. The athlete runs fast who also jumps high is not maintaining projectivity. That is because runs to jumps. There is a head modifier dependency and intervening words. Uh, you must have a path to them. So when you go from runs to jumps, jumps to who, jumps to also, there is a path. But jumps to fast, there is no path. OK, on the other hand, uh, if you have this projective representation, I have I of course have to solve this problem of runs to athlete, but that is not a problem. Uh, you need uh, an N sub from runs to athlete, but you see here, uh, so jump uh, runs to jump. There is this C comp relation in between word is high, but you have a path to high also runs to jump jumps to high. So these were all the yes. questions. 
these are all the questions uh, sir i have a doubt uh, yeah so so why did we promote 29 in november 29 that still remains oh that still remains uh, 29 okay So this is um, an NP, November 29. This NNP is actually an adjective. OK, so 29 is the. This is like golf ball. OK, or badminton stick, cricket bat. So here though, now is a noun. Uh, it's, it is an adjectival qualifying 29. The noun in 29. OK, and so if we write it like, like uh, 29 November, mm -hmm. then the 29 becomes adject adjectival to November, right? So yes. Then should we promote November? Yes, yes, that's right. OK. OK, thank you. And in that case, to be correct, 29. So then it will not right. be CD, the, it will be an ordinal. Yes, sir. thank you. Sir? Uh, I had a doubt. So, in the definition of um, projectivity, mm. uh, it's written that there is, should be a path from head to every word that lies between head and dependent. So, yes. uh, in the athlete example, we did have a path from head mm. to um, the. In, uh, so, here from runs, we uh, we have a path to fast. So head is runs here, right? Oh, OK, so oh, I see. So you're saying that this. Achha, achha. Yeah, no, so the intent is that you go to uh, modifier. OK, and then modifier come to, uh, you should come to the intervening words. So I think that uh, wording has to be. Uh, modified a bit. Hmm. So I'll do that. Hmm. OK. Yeah. OK, that's all. Hmm? Thank you.